I know you were enjoying the beach, weren't you? Yes, from the beach. Yeah. <laughs> Well, good morning. So glad to see you on this beautiful day. So, um, we will start by praying and uh, giving our day to the Lord. So, uh, all right. Well, Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. We thank you so much for the blessing of being able to be part of your family. Lord, I am so grateful that as we begin the service today, that we can know that wherever two or more are gathered in your name, that you are here in our midst. And Lord, we pray that those that are on their way um, would be safe coming to church and that uh, Father, you would just uh, bless our time of worship today as we just enjoy being in your presence and with your people. Father, it's so easy to uh, let the things of this world really kind of consume our thoughts and our minds. But Father, I pray that you would give us the ability to set those aside so that we could focus on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good to see you. So, <clears throat> I don't often say this or ask this, but why don't you stand? This is a good hand clapping, foot stomping song. So, <laughs> oh, some clap. Morning, when this life is over, I fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I fly away. Oh, I fly away. Oh, glory. I fly away when I die.
awesome. Well, you can have a seat. That was very nice. heard 
That's why I trust him. That's why I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard. And he answered, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered, that's why I trust him, that's why I trust in God. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once alone, but now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. Twas grace. That taught my heart to fear and grace my fear. Really, how precious did that great fear the hour I first my I've been set free, my God, my Savior, fans of me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Has promised good to me. His word, my hopes. He will my shield and portion me as long as life can do. My chains are gone. Shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God, who called me here alone, will be forever mine. Will be.
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Praise to 
And Jesus, we, we really do adore you. What you have done for us is amazing. Father, that you would die in our place. We who have sinned against you. Father, that's just a miracle. The love that you showed to us is just phenomenal. And today, Lord, as we lift up our songs of praise to you, I pray that we have blessed your heart. That, Father, the singing, the joy that we have expressed for your goodness, that you would feel from our hearts, and, Lord, that we would, in return, also be blessed and filled with joy because of the wonder of your name. So, Father, we give you our praise, our worship, and our time in the Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, prayer requests. We have a list of things for you here. Um, <clears throat> Operation Christmas Child, uh, just to kind of catch you up, behind the wall here where all the coffee and the snacks and the goodies are is where our tithe is, but also there's a little bucket of coin there, and we save up our coin, and we toss it in there for that particular program. So feel free to, to uh, bring in your loose change. Um, again, pray for um, our river corridor and uh, the rebuild and recovery from all the fires over the years. Our unsaved loved ones, persecuted believers, and then, of course, keep our churches in prayer. Uh, the Bible Church, uh, who we had a good service with last week on Easter, and then the Assembly of God and uh, the Catholic Church um, across the parking lot here. Uh, just keep um, them all in prayer as well as Happy Camp Christian Fellowship. So there's a list of folks there with cancer. Dory, Ed, Lester, Kevin, Jimmy, Mick, Jennifer, Julianne, and then Charlie Feely. Now, some of you may not know Charlie's situation. However, you might have seen it out on Facebook because they've been doing some fundraising and, and that sort of thing. And uh, when he had gone to the doctor... They had told him that there was a 90% chance that it was cancer and that they would have to remove his bladder and uh, one of his kidneys. And I said, well, Charlie, we're just going to pray for the 10% because God works in that kind of way. And anyhow, he came in on Thursday or Friday, I can't remember which, um, and he said, well, this is what they're telling me now. It's not my bladder and it's not my kidney, but it's some muscle tissue around there. And so he probably will not lose his bladder or his kidney, just some muscle tissue. And, and we just say, praise the Lord. So, you know, um, you might be handed some devastating news, <laughs> but you know, with God, all things are possible. However, you also have to understand the, the flip side of that coin, which is, do you want to remain here forever? I don't. I want to go to heaven. <laughs> so, you know, it is awesome to pray the will of the Lord in these situations because if we do stay here, then we still get to hang out together as a family, as a fellowship. And I mean, I've known Charlie since actually not long after we moved here in um, August of 1998 because um, Alex broke his collarbone and he uh, came rushing up in the ambulance, you know, after Robin had called 911 and I said, I'm not sure why you're calling 911. There's no ambulances this far away. <laughs> so the rest of that is history because we have um, been part of that and um, whatnot for so many years. But um, Charlie is a very dear friend and we have spent so many hours uh, in the ambulance talking about uh, Jesus and, and his grandmother that, you know, uh, taught them about the Lord and that kind of stuff. So, um, so when they asked to put him on the prayer list, I was like, 
no problem. So, yeah. So he's got a bunch of family coming in here before too long and some folks that he gets to see. So anyway, but the folks that are on our list, keep, keep them in our prayers and, uh, and their needs. Now we have, again, another long list um, of folks on our list here. And unless you see some changes, let me know. But there are, again, several names of folks here that, that need um, our prayer. The only update that I can really think of is um, Brentley and Brody, the two little preemies that were supposed to have died um, a long time ago because of the problems that they had. The Lord had sustained them and uh, whatnot. Well, now they're in uh, kind of dire straits again. So, and we have seen that, um, even with like little Zara, who, again, you remember her heart was like upside down and backward, mm -hmm. and yet she's already over three years old, probably pushing four here before too long. So, you know, God is a God of wonder. He's a God of the miraculous. You know, we think that things are impossible, but for God, what is impossible? Nothing. Mm -hmm. So he can do anything. However, in all of these, we, we want to pray that his will is done. Ours tends to be a little bit on the selfish side. Um, I speak for myself, but um, I'm sure that you are not a whole lot different than I. But I don't want to lose people. However, we don't. If they are saved, they are going to heaven. I believe that um, with kids, uh, you know, the Lord's just going to snatch them right up and take them. And we're going to have just a great time in heaven. So pray for all of the folks that are on um, this list um, and the few little things that are uh, there at the end, the struggles with uh, identity issues, family relationships, um, our kids, and then life's troubles. So would you like to add to this list and say, yes, please put this person or situation on the prayer list? I have two things. One is a prayer request and one is a praise um, prayer request. My daughter is going to be traveling on Wednesday with her brother mm -hmm. and Alexis um, from here to spend a week with them and go to a concert in Portland. Please keep her in prayer. She's going to be downtown in Portland. So, <laughs> God, please keep her in prayer. <laughs> I, I'm a very nervous mother at the moment, so... <laughs> So yeah. um, there, there's prayer requests there. She'll be back um, the following Wednesday, I believe. Her brother's going to be bringing her back, so whenever you decide. And praise report, praise report, at the end of this week, we now have, we've now put the, new, the, late, the last payment on the property. And the stage where we are now is we're waiting to receive the final official legal documents for that property. Nice. All Felicia has to do is go in and get something notarized for her end, and then I need to fill out form and sign. I don't need a notary for that, but then we will officially be property owners. Nice. Oh, yeah. I am ridiculously <laughs> excited. Like, giddy to the point of bunny hopping up and down the hall on the road. So, <laughs> it was kind of ridiculous, but at the same time, wow. Yeah. <laughs> is there a piece of dirt? So, yeah. yeah. It, it, God is good. He says when you're faithful in the little things, God he will give good. you bigger things. So, yeah. that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes. For my oldest son, David, please, on um, Tuesday, he'll be talking to the sick at the Free Clinical Center with what you need to do with his, what they're going to do with him. a friend that went through a bone marrow transplant and she wasn't really expected to do well and she's been around for a long time so God is good. So Robin? Oh I was just going to say just kind of like a um, <coughs> for a praise like she has to um, just a just a prayer for you know continue to provision for um, our uh, little daycare and stuff mm -hmm. down there. Mm -hmm. We're doing good up in um, up until I think July, and then after that, we'll have to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody wants to come to casino night, <laughs> that's next <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> we have to support this, the child care. 
Um, and uh, just that um, uh, I just haven't been having some medical things. Certain things are getting better. I've got a little um, tremor thing that I've got going on that comes and it goes. I'm trying to, you know, do things to figure out what's going on there because I have um, Parkinson's and dementia in my family. And so I'm not sure if it's stemming from that or if it's stemming from other things. So just keep that in prayer that they'll figure out how to, you know, deal with me. I'm just trying vitamins and water and some stress reduction and other things. So, um, and then, uh, yeah, just to praise that, um, uh, that um, we were able to, you know, see a lot of people on Sunday, um, last Sunday. Mm -hmm. That was kind of just nice to see. Yeah. Us. It was a good time last yeah, week, or last week for the Easter. Um, mm -hmm. Sounds like they're maybe moving in April, so I don't yeah. know. Well, they're working on that direction for sure. But it was nice to see mm -hmm. them. It was good to see everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody? Bob? Yeah, I've got two things on the list. Uh, Bill Manzo, uh, um, actually the, the most important thing now for him is uh, his shoulder surgery. He's trying to get the right. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, and then uh, we had a great report from Rusty oh. at men's breakfast. That dark spot on his lungs was uh, a shadow from some tissue or something. Oh, yeah. That is good. And so he doesn't have cancer or black spot mm -hmm. in his lungs. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah. He might have. We don't know what the yeah. Lord did about that. But right. <laughs> Absolutely. Anybody else? Okay, well, let's pray and give these to the Lord. Father, I am so grateful that you care so deeply about even the least of our worries, our needs. Father, your word actually tells us not to worry about anything, but to pray about everything. And that, Father, you give us a peace that passes understanding. So, Father, it is such a, a joy and a privilege to be able to lay these requests at your feet, to stand with these folks, and just mm -hmm. say, we're going to continue to pray. We're going to continue to think about and support them. Father, I am so grateful that you do give us answers and that you are the God of miracles. For you, it's just an average day. But for us, Lord, who are human, Father, we are so thankful that you are such a powerful God. We thank you, Lord, that you accomplish your will in our lives. And we ask now, Lord, that you would accomplish your will in each of these situations. We thank you for hearing us and for answering us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, birthdays. Um, I forgot to look at the birthday book. So anybody have a birthday? Uh, nobody wants to confess, huh? We did hers last week because I know there were some, but I didn't know if I missed anybody that isn't on the list for this week or last week because it was Easter. Um, but I didn't look, so I just see Heather running down there. She's going to find out if you're not telling us the truth. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> the box, the box, and the box. Uh, tithes. Again, thank you for your faithfulness in uh, this aspect. Um, the Lord does ask us to trust him in that. And actually in Malachi 3, he says, put me to the test and see if I won't bless you. So um, other things going on during the week, Friday men's prayer breakfast, and the menu this week is waffles. waffles. Not, not your favorite. Big, 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 big waffles. Big waffles. <laughs> Take up the plate. So guys, 7 a.m., and that's over at the Bible Church. Um, and then an everybody welcome um, service. Uh, Wednesdays, 9 a.m., also held at the Bible Church. And then up at the assembly, we have our book study. This week, we're supposed to wrap up uh, the last part of the book that we're going through in our James study. So 
I'll let you know what the next book is, but um, that is a potluck and Bible study up at the Assembly of God, 6 p.m. And then pray for the kids, our youth and our wee ones, and then no birthdays. All right. Nobody's, nobody's scamming us. So, All right. Now. Laughter, the best medicine. Are you ready for this? What do you call an overweight psychic? That's a tough one, isn't it? An overweight psychic. All right, you ready for this? A four chin teller. <laughs> oh, hey. Yeah. I heard that one the other day. I was rolling on the floor. So, all right. Well, why don't you stand and greet one another? And, uh, Good morning. Hi, I'm Glenda. Glenda? Glenda. Nice Trying to meet you. Church, I'm Kirk. Hi, Kirk. Nice to meet you.
Okay. Well, we need to remember to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as the scripture would say. Um, there's some interesting things happening in the Middle East. Um, earlier this week, uh, we uh, saw that Israel and question mark the USA, although we're denying any involvement in it, um, they took out a portion of the Iranian <coughs> consulate in uh, uh, Damascus. And the reason that they did that and they struck that was because there were some really big, big named leaders um, in uh, that consulate at that time in that specific room. It was a very uh, exacting strike. Um, and because of the death of those leaders now, Iran has said, we're going to have to strike back. Everybody was expecting it to happen right away on Friday. Um, however, Israel's been jamming GPS and doing all kinds of stuff over there. Um, but it, it's such big names that were um, taken out that literally um, all the Jewish people ran to the store, they bought generators, they bought, you know, kind of like, remember COVID when everybody basically took all the tissue, you know? I mean, like, I don't know what they thought that they were going to do with all that tissue, but okay. Anyhow, but the, the markets are um, somewhat bare now because of that. However, has Iran struck back? Not to the extent that was expected. Have they? Yeah, but not quite like uh, what you're thinking. However, with everything happening in the world today, don't you find it interesting that pretty much the entire world really knows that there is an end coming? We understand that. And it isn't because of climate change and all of those kinds of things that they are, you know, proclaiming. Um, like, uh, oh, what's her name? Greta. Thornburg or whatever, who got arrested in um, Hague earlier in the week. You know, yes, they're protesting all kinds of things, but really deep down in people's heart of hearts, they really feel like this world is coming to an end, that World War III is about to happen. And when we do look at all the current uh, issues and situations, as well as what the Lord says would happen, um, that's really the key. Uh, is to look at what he says will happen. And he said, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, when you hear of uh, earthquakes and things of that nature, which um, the strongest earthquake in 120 years, 140 years, something like that happened in New Jersey, um, you would have thought that they were all um, gonna die um, with a little bit of shaking over there and and whatnot, and the news folks said, now listen, we understand you Californians over there are used to dealing with this almost every day, but over here, this is unusual for us, so it kind of sets us on edge, but you know, it is interesting that there's a lot of predictions on a lot of things that are going on right now, um, and they're not all coming true, but you know whose word always comes true? God's word, every single word of it comes true. So tomorrow um, is the end of the world as we know it. Why? Because we're also going to have an eclipse. Like there's never been an eclipse ever before. It's not like you can't plan for these things. Oh, wait, we can because they happen regularly, you know, but uh, they're not full. And that I can remember as a little kid, being um, in the Sam's Valley Elementary School and there was going to be a full eclipse of the sun and they didn't want any of the little kids to stare at the sun and burn their eyeballs out, um, of which they told us would happen um, if we looked at the sun during that time, kind of freak us all out. Um, now we got cool glasses and all kinds of stuff that we can See, but I can remember them taping Visqueen around the whole school. We couldn't go outside. However, you know, um, 
hey, these things happen. Is it the end of the world as we know it? No. Why? What does Jesus say? He said that, you know, it's going to be kind of a normal day when you're not really expecting things to happen. Two men walking along, one disappears, the other one left standing there. You know, it's things like that that he says in the scripture that not that, hey, when the, the eclipse happens and that it crosses all these cities named Nineveh and that there's judgment and, you know, no, that's not the God that we serve. The God that we serve died on the cross for how many sins of the world? All, all of them. So does anybody have any sin? Yeah. Of course we do. But is it forgiven? Yes. yes. So then all we have to do is just choose what side we're going to go with. Are we going to stand with the Lord or are we going to stand with the enemy? If we're standing with the enemy, where is he getting sent? To hell. And if we are standing with the Lord... Where do we get to go? Heaven. So we just need to remember to pray for these things and not worry about them. Amen? So Father, help us to remember to pray for Jerusalem. Help us to remember to pray diligently as they are your chosen people. Father, we understand that they don't all love you at this point. And they don't always understand what is happening. But Father, you will save your people. And I am so glad that you have kept your promise to them. Because Father, then we can understand that we can believe the promises that you have given to us. So we ask, Lord, that you would bless them. That you would bring peace their way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well you can turn to Revelation chapter 17. So, <clears throat> we are, um, again, going back and forth uh, until we end um, the book of Revelation. Um, we open up the word and we go chapter by chapter and verse by verse. So, our regular study is in 1 Timothy. So next week will be chapter 6. We'll finish up that book and then we'll move into 2 Timothy. Um, but we've got about, oh, five or six more weeks of the book of Revelation. And, uh, but that's going to be every other week. And then after that, we will go back to our chapter by chapter and verse by verse study. But today we find ourselves in chapter 17. And this is a very interesting um, particular section of the scripture because we're dealing with the issue of Babylon. So Babylon is located where? I mean the real one. Middle East. Oh. Okay, Middle East. That's, that's a, yes, it, it, it was located there. But where was it originally located? Iraq. Iraq. Okay. Now, is Babylon in Iraq today? No, there's, there's no Babylon over there. Okay, so then we have to understand that when we look at the term Babylon, which we will see in the next couple chapters I am speaking of, is it really going to be talking about the place? No, because the place doesn't exist anymore, right? So now we have to look at this from a different perspective. And it is very clear to us, the book of Revelation, isn't it? Why is it that the book of Revelation is a lot easier to understand than we may think of? Why? Because God gave us the divine outline. And where is that found? Chapter 1, verse 19. Very good. <clears throat> Debbie's heard this a few times. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 19, where God said to John, write the things which were, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So that is the progression of the book of Revelation. Now, after chapter 1, which speaks of the things which were. 
And what had taken place? Christ crucified, him resurrected and glorified. That's what we celebrated last week, as well as throwing eggs in grass and hiding them in trees so that the kids could run around and find them, right? That Easter celebration, or as the world would call it, Ishtar celebration, right? We're going to get into a little bit about that because that's where some of these um, practices and celebrations came from it was way back when, um, starting way back in the book of Genesis where Babylon was first mentioned. So it's mentioned at the very beginning and it's mentioned at the end uh, and it's uh, going to be wrapped up here. It's going away for, for certain this time. But in chapter 1, we see God crucified, resurrected, and glorified. And then chapters two and three, the things which are, which is uh, the church age. Are we still here? Then we're still in the church age. Chapters two and three, God writes a letter to the seven churches, each one addressing their issues and their, and their problems and the things that they need to, to do to remain faithful to him. And that if they remain faithful, that they will uh, be rewarded with heaven. And that's such a blessing. So then what comes after chapters two and three? Chapters four and five. Always have, always will. That's just the way it works. Uh, and what happens at the very beginning of chapter four? We see the words hereafter or metatauta. And we see it twice in the first um, couple verses. Why? Well, one, to show a transition from chapters 3 to 4, but also a transition from church age to our heavenly age. The church is raptured. It is taken up into heaven. It is caught up by the Lord um, as his voice is sounded in the form of a trumpet, and that is just going to be an amazing day. Um, I did see a lot of posts on Facebook here that folks wanted to get a bunch of blow up dolls and fill them with helium so that when the um, eclipse happens, they would let them go and it would look like the rapture. Um, okay, but if you don't know scripture, God says that that's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. It's not going to be, you know, so anyway. Um, I'm sure that God probably laughs at some of the stuff that he sees and whatnot, but y you got to say, you know what? Some people are pretty creative there. You know, <laughs> I had to laugh at some of that, but anyhow, we're going to be in heaven for how long? Seven years of what? <clears throat> no, because we got to come back. You got to remember, we're going to be coming back with the Lord. So how long are we going to be in heaven? For seven years, a heptad, a period of seven, just like a Jewish wedding week, Jesus calls us his bride and he is our bridegroom. We are in heaven with him celebrating that week, that period of seven years, just as Daniel said uh, in the book of Daniel, when he was talking about some of the prophecies that were unfolding there to the king of Babylon at that time, uh, there was one week that hasn't been fulfilled in that 490 year period of time. And that we are still waiting on. And that is an amazing thing. We will be in heaven for um, that week or that period of seven, that seven years celebrating our wedding with Jesus. And I love that. Why? Because seven is the number of what? Very good. Very good. Which means when you come to the end of that seven day period, it is all done. It's complete. So literally the number seven means completion, but it also speaks of God who is perfection. So we see that we're going to be with him for the perfect amount of time before we come back with him and he takes over uh, the earth once and for all, puts uh, an end to, to sin and all of that stuff. And we rule and reign with him for how long? Seven years. A thousand years. 
okay? So where are we at in this cycle? We have chapter one, the things which were, chapters two and three, the things which are, the hereafter, four and five, we're in heaven, but then six through 19 is the same seven year period back here on earth, and that is known as the great tribulation. That's where we're at. Because once we finish chapter 19, then we go to chapter 20, which we have the um, thousand year reign, the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. And then when we get to 21 and 22, we, we all live happily ever after from that point on in heaven. And that's going to be a great time. But that's the outline that God gives to us. And we find ourselves in Revelation chapter 17. And we will get to see Mystery Babylon. Now, this first uh, section that we are looking at will have um, two, uh, two sections of this. The first one that we're going to deal with is the spiritual Babylon. And then the next one will be political Babylon. So we're going to deal with um, spiritual, and then um, not next week, but the week after, we'll deal with politics. So you can bring all your arguments. And <laughs> All right, verse 1. One of the seven angels who poured out the seven bowls came over, and he spoke to me. Come with me, he said, and I will show you the judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute who rules over many waters. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk with the wine of her immorality. Now, this is interesting because, and uh, I need to stick to my notes because this is pretty um, specific when we're talking about some of these things, but God goes to battle with this spiritual Babylon. This Babylon says that it is upon many waters. Now, what, when we look at many waters, uh, what is being spoken of? Some people would say, well, that's uh, Jeremiah uh, 51 concerning the Euphrates River. But what did we just learn about the Euphrates River in the prior chapter? What's going to happen to it? and is happening to it even as we speak. It's drying up. So you're not really sitting upon many waters if this is the Euphrates River. On top of that, um, the Euphrates River travels from Turkey and then down into a portion of the Middle East. But are there really many waters there in the Middle East? No. So that really wouldn't make sense. So we can't really go by Jeremiah 51 because that's not what the Lord was speaking of here even though some might argue that because of the language in um, 51, but at that time for Jeremiah, the Lord told him to write those things. So <clears throat> um, if you went through geography and you learned about some of that stuff um, in college or whatnot, um, <clears throat> you would learn that Italy is surrounded by five oceans. Italy has also four seas, five oceans, four seas. That is a lot of water for just one little place. That is where the focus is taking us to right here. So we are going to be thinking about Italy. Well, <clears throat> um, there is no place in Italy that is more than 75 miles from a coastline, which is kind of crazy to think that, you know, we could drive to Wairica and we would be at the ocean no matter what direction we went. Um, that's kind of cool because uh, you know, go surfing a lot. Well, they don't have a lot of surfing water, but anyhow, um, it really does sit upon many waters. Now, when we're talking about this spiritual Babylon, we also have to remember um, what the scripture says that uh, this is due, the reason that God is going to get rid of them is due to the evil that they have brought into the world. The world committed adultery with her. Now, when we're talking about this, we're not just talking about 
um, a physical adultery, but also, even as the Lord would say concerning um, his people Israel, that they would, would have sought other gods. And he equated that to adultery, um, cheating on him. Well, um, it says here that the kings committed fornication with her. Um, and humanity has been made drunk with the wine of her for fornication. So what does all of this mean? And what is it that sits at the heart or the seat of Italy? Rome. What we are going to see in the tribulation, of course, not, we'll be hanging out with Jesus. So, But those that are left behind will see that Rome will once again become a huge and powerful city. Is it not still that way today to a certain extent? Yes, but who is it that runs all of that? The, the Pope and not even so much the Pope because the current one that's in there now is going to die. In fact, he missed his last celebration because he was so ill that he couldn't go to that celebration. And how many Popes have there been? A lot. Okay, and so the one that is going to show up here isn't just one person. So a lot of people would say that the Pope is the Antichrist. No, he's not. The Antichrist is the Antichrist. Um, the Pope is the Pope. Uh, but it says here that um, I will show you the judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute. If we're talking about Rome, the Pope and and the uh, Catholic Church of the Tribulation. We're not talking about the Catholic Church today. We know the folks from our Catholic Church here very well, and I have spoken to many of them, and they are firm believers in Jesus Christ, Him crucified. I have many Christian Catholic uh, friends and whatnot, but this is during the Tribulation. Where is the church? Chapters 2 and 3 that are mentioned there, where did we go? Well, what comes after chapters 2 and 3? Chapters 4 and chapters 5. Where are we? We're in heaven. We've been taken out, right? So that being the case, that included one of those churches that was listed there of the seven letters is the Catholic Church. And so those people who believe in the Lord, who love her, are going to be taken to heaven. The people that are left behind that don't love the Lord, as we have seen, many have been given multiple chances to come to Jesus, even during the tribulation. But right at the end of chapter 16, what did we see? That they hate her. Many people hate her. So we're not looking at this Catholic church the way we see the Catholic church today. Many of the things that are going on in the Catholic church uh, today aren't what they used to be, nor are they what's coming. So here, this is what is coming, but have they been a problem over the years? Um, yes. Has the Christian church been a problem over the years? Yes. Are they still a problem to this day? Hey, look, if you are not worshiping the Lord, then you are part of the problem. And we see a lot of that. And why are churches a problem? Well, because they are filled with people. And people do what? We sin. Okay, so we have to understand. We're not picking on any church or the Catholic Church. We're talking about the tribulation. Because the church has been caught up. It has been raptured up starting tomorrow when the... Um, uh, <laughs> When the eclipse happens, no, I, I tease, I'm joking, but we have to understand that during this time, the revived Roman Empire will um, embody uh, what the Lord is saying here. They will just be filled with sin and debauchery. So um, this is um, who is going to, in a sense, become part of the governing body during the tri tribulation. Verse 3, so the angel took me in the spirit into the wilderness, and there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So we have the woman. The woman, we just got through talking about who? 
the revived Roman Empire, the Catholic Church of the Tribulation, that is the woman, okay? So that we see that the woman is sitting on a scarlet what? Beast. A lot of people say it's the Pope. Um, no, that, that, that beast is going to be a military guy. One who comes saying, we're going to bring peace and prosperity. He makes uh, deals with Israel, which the Pope wouldn't generally do, right? He doesn't make political uh, deals and, and that kind of thing. But um, in, in that seven-year time, halfway into it, what does the beast, what does the Antichrist do? He goes into the temple, he commits the abomination of desolation, <clears throat> and he declares himself to be God. At that point, you remember, the Jews will do what? They will get up and they will run to Petra, okay? So now that seven-year deal that he uh, is broken, okay? And so now here in this seven-year period, there is a woman sitting with the scarlet beast, sitting on. David Hunt, Dave Hunt writes a great book called The Woman Who Rides the Beast. Um, I think it's Harvest House Publishers that uh, did that one. Um, came out many years ago. He explains why this is and in great detail. I don't want to go into a tremendous amount of great detail here because we'll be here for a long time. So um, we are looking at spiritual uh, issue here. This is basically Rome. A woman uh, sitting on the scarlet beast had seven heads and ten horns and blasphemies against God were written all over it. Now, blasphemies. When we think about church, as a whole, not just one or, or another, has the church really put up a lot of idols? Yeah, some could even argue that, you know, if you're wearing a cross, um, that can be an idol. A lot of people kind of tend to want to bow down to that kind of stuff. I can remember even when you're carrying your Bible, people treat that as though um, it were God, even though it's the word that he spoke. And so you didn't dare set it on the floor or, you know, let it get dusty or any of that. Oh, that's the Holy Bible. Well, you know, I understand that it is holy in the sense that it's God who spoke it, but it is still paper. It's not holy. I don't bow down to the Bible. I listen to the words that are written in it because that's where the power is. It is not in the book uh, and the pages in and of itself. What about them little fishes that we stick on the back, the ichthus fishes that we stick on the back of our, you know, I would not want to put one of those on my car just because there's times that, um, um, you know, maybe I go a little faster than I should, especially responding to ambulance calls or things like that. And they're like, there goes that Christian guy again, you know, um, breaking the law. We do a lot of things um, that do uh, worship the Lord. But when we think about the Catholic Church, and not the, the one that's maybe across the street or that kind of thing, but in generations past, um, did they have a lot of idols? Oh, my. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. And they loved their idols, and they loved their traditions. And at one point, Constantine took over the whole world because that's kind of what everybody wants to do. You know, China's looking to do that. The Antichrist will. Um, at some point, but when Constantine came in and took over everything, when he spoke to the leadership of the Catholic Church during that age and during that era, what did they say? Hey, we don't want you to run things. There should be the separation. And Constantine said, no, um, I saw a flaming cross in the sky, uh, therefore, um, God spoke to me, and the entirety of my kingdom is going to be Christian. But in order to keep the political side of things, the political spiritual side of things, what did he do? 
He said, but you don't have to stop your traditions. You don't have to stop worshiping your idols and your things. I just want you to blend them together. And if we go back to the very beginning of um, humanity, when we think back to the Tower of Babel, when we think back to some of those things that were created during that time, we're going to get into that here in just a moment. A lot of that still continues to this day. When I went and visited um, over in Europe, Germany and Italy and so many of the other places there, it really kind of blew my mind, the magnificence of the church. Okay, well, they're going to have to talk to um, her and just see what's going on, okay? <clears throat> so, um, Abby's not feeling good, so... When we think back to how these things started, do they still continue to this day? Absolutely. Why? Because we are a people of repetition. We like to do things over and over and over again. What goes around comes around again. And so we see Babylon start in the, the book of Genesis and it will end in the book of Genesis. And so do all of the same issues and the same situations. So it says here that um, blasphemies were written all over it. Uh, the woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and the beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. And in her hand, she held a goblet, a gold goblet full of obscenities and impurities of her immorality. So <clears throat> when we think back through history to that time in Genesis, we come across um, a woman who was uh, called the queen of heaven. Her name was Semiramis. You remember that. And uh, she had a son uh, who she had uh, been married uh, to Nimrod. You remember that, that guy from back in those stories? Well, Nimrod died, and uh, Semiramis somehow miraculously um, became pregnant. Uh, now, does that sound familiar? Sounds like a familiar story. A miraculous conception? Hmm. You know, Satan never does anything original. He basically just steals the story and tries to do it on his own. So this has been happening since the beginning of time, since Genesis, okay? So um, Semiramis uh, was considered the high priestess during that time, also referred to as the queen of heaven. Now, in the Catholic faith, who is also referred to as the queen of heaven? Mary. Mary. So we can see that there's a blending that goes on in a lot of this stuff. And a lot of people, not so much here in America, but in maybe other countries, worship Jesus or do they worship Mary? They worship Mary because they pray to her. And yet, what, did, what was the last recorded words that we ever see from Mary? She points to the disciples and she says, listen to him. And who is she speaking of? Jesus. Jesus. And that is really kind of a, a poignant situation there because really, who is the one who is God? Jesus. Who is the one who claimed to be God? Jesus. Then why would we pray to Mary, who is not God? She is a human being. However, was she most blessed above all women? Absolutely. So in the sense of honoring her for the job that she did and the servant that she was, I have no problem with. But praying to her versus praying to Jesus becomes a problematic situation. Well, this is going to be revived again in the tribulation, um, this kind of ideal, ideological uh, idol worship during that time. Well, Semiramis claimed to have a miraculous uh, conception after the uh, death of her husband, and she named her son Tammuz. Um, the name derived from 
an, an old name, uh, Demuzu, which was the Babylonian sun god. Interesting that she names her son the son of God, the bright shining one that's going to get covered up here tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting how Satan uses these things, and all he does is duplicate. He pretends to have something that uh, is really not there. So, well, uh, Tammuz is depicted in um, uh, many statues um, as being held in his mother's arms. He was considered um, the savior of the world at that time. And when he was around 40 years old, he was killed by a beast. And what was that, that beast? A wild boar. He was killed by a pig. Um, which is interesting because in the uh, Jewish faith, um, pigs were looked at as dirty, filthy animals, right? They had a cloven hoof, but they didn't chew their cud, so you didn't eat them, you didn't deal with them, you didn't touch them. Well, here, this guy gets killed by one. Um, <clears throat> his supposed lover at that time was a fertility, um, a, a, a fertility goddess, and what was her name? Ishtar, which is where we get the English word Easter. And how did they celebrate it? Well, the fact that she was a fertility god, lots of eggs, and they would brightly color them in their celebrations and things like that. And um, they would also eat the beast that killed Tammuz. They would eat pigs. So what meat is the preferred meat that we see on sale at the markets um, during Easter? Ham. Kill that pig, right? Eat that thing, right? And then what else do we do? We dye eggs and we color them and then we hide them around. You know, all of this stuff was mixed into uh, church, if you will. So does that mean that of all the celebrations that we have seen throughout the world, including in this era, uh, Christmas was also dealt with, um, the Yule log, they would um, fasten a tree with nails um, as it says in the scriptures in Jeremiah, they were told, don't do this. This is a pagan holiday. And they would dress it up with gold and silver and, you know, all kinds of things. So do we celebrate Easter? Absolutely we do. Do we celebrate Christmas? Absolutely we do. We take what Satan intends for evil and we make it good. We make it about Jesus. After all, who created this world? Jesus. It's Satan who has the problem. We should celebrate Jesus. We should celebrate the resurrection. We should celebrate his love and his joy and his peace and his patience and all those things that we receive from him throughout the year. We should celebrate them all. Even Jesus went and celebrated a lot of things. <clears throat> a lot of people would say, oh, you shouldn't celebrate that. So therefore, we should have no celebrations. Well, gee, how boring would that be, you know? God created us. He created us to want to celebrate, to want to worship. That is innate in us. And so we don't do it the same way the world does. We do it because we say, hey, on Easter, what happened? Jesus rose again from the dead. Satan, that kind of pig of a guy, tried to kill Jesus. But Jesus, who is the lamb uh, who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus, who is the Son of God, not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N of God, is the one who came to save us from ourselves, our own sin. Well, these things were being celebrated way back when because Satan basically stole the story. And so this is nothing new. Satan comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. So now we celebrate these things, but we dial them into our Savior. So, um, it is interesting when we're talking about spiritual Babylon, that Babylon, the name itself means confusion. Which is interesting because the enemy tries to step in and cause what? Confusion. 
And so this place is a place of confusion that will rise out of Rome once again, a spiritual Babylon, through the Catholic Church of the Tribulation, and they will be judged because of their idolatry. Not the idolatry that we have already experienced in today's world because all of the sins of the world are forgiven. They're all gone, right? Now we just worship Jesus, but then they will still continue to do the same thing, but they won't be praising God. They'll be praising themselves. So, um, <clears throat> literally, historically, Babylon was understood to be the gate of God. Um, and so uh, that is kind of where we're going to see some of that stuff. Um, there was a lot of very evil things that happened in the Catholic Church uh, back in the day, uh, but you could say the same thing with the Christian Church as well. Um, so, has church always been the greatest uh, example? <laughs> Hardly so, huh? So, um, but we are here today because the amount of time that we spend in the Word helps us to stay uh, pure, stay away from sin. Any time we spend with the Lord is um, a good time. So, it won't return void, and we just need to continue to be faithful. Well, <clears throat> um, this new spiritual Babylon will be kind of a combination of all religions because there's only going to be one, so they're just going to wrap it all together. Uh, and it's going to be more along the lines of, uh, hey, if you just do good, then we'll all uh, get along well. Do we see that kind of idea today? Um, yeah, on the bumper sticker you might see on the back of car, I think it's the words that spelled um, exist, and it's just all the symbols of the different world religions. Oh, if our coexist, maybe that's what it is. Uh, and yes, we're just all supposed to be one big happy family. The problem is, is sin, sin still abounds. And the problem with sin is uh, it leads to death. And so we can't just keep saying, well, everybody should just do their own thing and we're all going to be fine. We can't. We can't do that. We have to do what is right. And um, <clears throat> in that regard, that will all go away uh, when uh, the church has been raptured out because the Holy Spirit will not be in the way anymore. He is the restrainer. Well, um, from there... Let's continue on. Verse 5, a mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. I could see that she was drunk, drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus, um, I stared at her in complete amazement. Would John have been amazed at the fact that, pardon me, a church would actually be involved in the killing of the saints of God? Well, we know that in the tribulation time, um, they want to remain an entity. They want to remain in control of what they have. In fact, when we're speaking of religious organizations, who is the richest organization in the entire world? Religious organization in the entire world. The Catholic Church. They have more, they have more money and more possessions than any government on the planet. Um, they, they hold everything. Well, the problem is, is when somebody has all the money, they get to make all of the rules. Okay, except that the Antichrist is going to be a bit of a jerk from what we understand, right? He's not going to put up with that kind of stuff. He's going to have the political side of things as well as the firepower to back up his will and his way. And so the only way to keep these two in existence, the spiritual and the political, you've got to bring them together. And that's what we're seeing happen here in the book of Revelation. So literally, she is given the name Babylon the Great, the mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. I could see that she was drunk and drunk with what? So the people that are getting saved during the time of the tribulation, what is the church out to do? 
destroy Christians. Have we seen that in the past from the Christian church? Absolutely. The inquisitions and things of that nature, uh, it was brutal. A lot of people died. But then you could also say the same thing about the Christian church. Have they gone and killed supposedly in the name of Jesus? Yes, they have. So we have to be very careful to do not our own will, but to do the will of God in church. And yet we've seen here that she's going to be um, part of um, the problem when it comes to killing God's people. Verse 7, um, why are you so amazed? The angel asked, I will tell you the mystery of this woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns on which she sits. The beast you saw um, was once alive, but it isn't now. <clears throat> and yet he will soon come up out of the bottomless pit and go to eternal destruction. And the people who belong to this world, whose names were not written in the book of life before the world was made, will be amazed at the reappearance of this beast who had died. Now we saw in other portions um, of the book of Revelation that somehow the beast will appear to be mortally wounded, uh, the Antichrist mortally wounded, and then what happens? They come back to life, right? So isn't that the same story as we heard in Genesis from Babylon there, Tammuz and that whole thing? And then in the New Testament, we see that Jesus um, came by miraculous birth, that he died and yet he rose again from the dead. And then we see the same thing in the book of Revelation. It's the same circle of life, you know? It's the same thing. Why? Because we're not very original. We keep doing the same thing over and over and over, just like our fashion trend. We just keep seeing it um, come around over and over. Well, here, um, this is going to be an interesting thing. People are going to be amazed and in awe, um, even as they were of Jesus. Thousands and thousands of people saw him break bread. And with five loaves and two little fishes, he fed 5,000 men. That doesn't include their families, right? So that would have been a whole lot of people. And there were 12 baskets left over. Uh, and yet, did they... Um, all come running and bow to him and praise him and love on him when he was hanging on the cross for their sins? No. <clears throat> what happened the week before? Oh, they were singing praises to him, laying palm branches in the street, thinking that he was going to take over politically. But he said, no, my kingdom is not of this world. This is a spiritual issue. So we see it move from spiritual to political. And when it got into the political, what did the people do? They said, well, we're sick of you. If you won't take over the political system, then we have no need for you and we are going to kill you. So in one breath, they're singing praises and saying Hosanna in the highest. And then, you know, Friday, not even a week later, they're telling um, the leadership uh, to, to hang him, to put him on the cross. Well, this guy is definitely going to be doing kind of a, a similar type scenario in uh, the fact that he's going to pull maybe a fast one. Um, and we know that this can happen because of AI. Man, you look at what AI can do today, you can make people say things that they don't really say. In fact, we post all of our services on uh, YouTube um, and then we put that link on our happycampfellowship.org page, right? Now, over the last month, when I have started to try and post those, we have to answer the questions on YouTube. Are you putting words into somebody's mouth? Are you using AI to make somebody say something that they didn't really say? And you have to answer those, which is interesting that we are having to put those rules out there in today's world. Fascinating to me. Well, they were amazed at this woman and at the beast with seven heads and ten horns upon which she sits. Well, let's continue on. 
um, in uh, this study here. Make sure I didn't miss anything. No, we talked about that. Okay. Verse 9. This calls for a mind with understanding. The seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. So just so that we're clear, the Lord would say, I am going to tell you who this really is. And you can go on Wikipedia or any of those. And what is known as the city of seven hills? Rome. Rome. Always has been. Okay. It's been known that way for many years. So just to clarify, God says, I don't want there to be any mistake. I don't want you to read other parts of um, the scriptures and say, oh, well, this is still in Iraq and somehow there's going to be Babylon rebuilt and all that. No, the Lord says very clearly here, here, the seven hills um, of the beast um, or the seven heads of the beast are on the seven hills where the woman rules. It is Rome. Where does the woman sit? The woman, speaking of the church, the church of Rome, the revived Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, where does it sit? In Italy, seven hills. They also represent seven kings. Now, this is fascinating. This is where we get to see the blend of spiritual and political because the Church of Rome would have, you know, seven kings, if you will, um, or uh, <clears throat> um, you have the representation, <clears throat> pardon me, of seven kings, but also the, the pastoral leadership that was there. They are blending now together. This church really does sit with the beast. So who would um, the kings be? Well, that's where we get a clue. And we have to think back to Daniel. You remember the king called all of his men and his <clears throat> soothsayers because he had a dream, didn't he? And that dream incorporated a statue. And uh, boy, um, when we think about that statue and it had a head of gold, which represented Babylon, it had a chest um, of silver, which represented the Medo-Persian Empire. And we can look at all this stuff came true, just as God said, the thighs of, um, of bronze, which symbolizes Greece. And now this is where... Rome would take over um, <clears throat> the, uh, the legs there um, that are uh, of iron. John would have understood who was ruling at that time, iron, but he wouldn't understand what the ten toes were because that hadn't come. So what were the ten toes made of? Iron and clay. Very good. Iron and clay. Have you ever mixed those two together? They don't stick together very well, do they? So you're going to have political party and spiritual party trying to mix. You're going to have rulers of the world during that time that are going to try and blend with the spiritual side of things, and it just isn't going to work. Iron and clay don't, um, don't go together. And there are how many toes on a foot? Five. And you got two feet, so how many ruling nations will there be, or kings in a sense of that? They're going to be ten, which is interesting. Um, <clears throat> so five kings have already fallen. So who are the five kings? Well, if you just take the statue, Babylon, Medo-Persian, um, Greece, that's only three. So who were the, the ruling um, entities before that. Well, you have to understand that there was the Assyrian Empire when you go back to um, the whole beginnings of Ishtar and that kind of thing. Um, uh, but you also had, before that, um, you had uh, Egypt. And Egypt is always a picture of what? The world. In fact, we just got through watching the movie that's broadcast all over television with Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments and that whole thing, they were all in rule. So we see that that has gone away. Egypt is gone. The Assyrian um, representation, which, um, you know, you can see some of that in uh, uh, Jonah and the giant fish or the great fish. Um, who was ruling um, during that time? 
Nineveh was part of that, right? And God called Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach 40 days and then destruction and, you know. But in this day and age during the tribulation, in the uh, passing of these five, Rome is still in power. And then after Rome will become this combination of spiritual, uh, Rome, uh, spiritual and political kings, other kings that are going to rule with her in a sense. Um, five kings have already fallen. The sixth now reigns. So this next guy comes up, uh, the seventh yet to come, meaning he's not here at that time. And who is that one that's going to rule? The Antichrist. He's going to be the one that uh, will come, but his reign will be brief, right? Because when we think back to the statue of Daniel, what happens to that statue in the dream? We are told of a huge rock that comes from heaven, uncut by human hands, that smashes into the idol and destroys it. Well, who is the rock? Jesus. Who is the one who is uncut by human hands, meaning nobody fashioned him? Jesus. Why? Because he always was, he always is, and he will ever be for more. You know what I mean? So really, that rock is going to come down and smash the idol, which represents the kingdoms of this world. So if five have passed and there's still a couple more to come, five and two is the number of completion and perfection. It's all done. Interesting. So this will be the last rule, um, as the Lord says. Well, verse 11, the scarlet beast that was but is no longer is the eighth king. And he is like the other seven. He's just like them. And he too is headed for destruction. The ten horns of the beast are the ten kings who have not yet risen to power, and they will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast. They're only going to be there for about three and a half years when he breaks, the beast breaks, or the Antichrist breaks his deal with Israel, and then he's going to take over everything. A lot of people have looked at this as the European Union, which started out to be the idea of how many ruling nations it's become a lot more than that. So that's all got to be kind of kind of changed up a bit. But it could be a lot of other things. What we do know is there's only going to be these 10 leaders and that's it. And their reign is going to be really brief because the Antichrist is going to step in halfway through it, declare himself to be God and say basically to the world, you will do what I want. End of story. And Israel runs off and then he tries to attack her. We've been through that in the previous chapters. Well, they will be appointed to their kingdoms for a brief moment to reign with the beast. Verse 13, and they will all agree to give him their power and authority. So the scripture says here that when the Antichrist steps up, that they, these ruling kings of these 10 nation confederate, will give him all power. They will believe in him as God and they will bow down to him and say, you are the all-powerful one. You are God and you have all authority. Interesting, because do they have any interest in the S-O-N, the true son of God? No. So we know that this is not the Catholic Church of today because we know that many of our friends and family that do um, uh, use... Uh, the Catholic Church for their place of study and their spiritual guidance are true believers of Jesus. Not all, just like you could say the same thing in the church today. Are all people that go to church Christians? No. So here, the entire entity gives everything to this one man. They bow down to him as God. Verse 14, together they will go to war with the Lamb. He will then convince them the enemy is the chosen people of God. What is happening in Israel right now? Pretty much the world is going uh, against all Israel, including the United States of America. We just earlier this week 
told Netanyahu, you need to back off. You need to stop it. In fact, Biden got on the phone with Netanyahu and said, this is it. It's over. You need to, to stop doing this. No more attacking Gaza. We're done. And this was backed up by Mr. Blinken, who um, politically got up in front of the news cameras and said, if this war in Gaza, who they attacked Israel, not the other way around, if this war doesn't stop, then our politics with Israel will stop. Our politics will change. Oh my, get ready America, because as soon as that happens, right next door to New York, what happened? A quake, not for 120 years. I'm not saying that that's because of what happened. What I am saying is those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse her will be. Watch out America. If we are not blessing Israel, if we're not standing up for God's chosen people, if we're not standing up for what's right, then we're part of the problem. Whoa, a lot of things going on right now. Well, together they will go to war uh, against the Lamb, Jesus, and the Lamb will defeat them. Who's going to win? Obvious. He always wins. With God, you are a majority. So you're going to win every time. Because he is the Lord of lords. He is the king of all kings. And um, his called and chosen and faithful ones will be with him. Who is going to come with him? His chosen ones, his called ones, right? So are we going to come with Jesus? Yes. We know that when we get to the end, when Jesus said that's it, he's going to come back after that seven years of our time in heaven and after seven years of tribulation here on earth, we are coming back with him. We are going to ride with him. He is going to do away um, with sin and he is going to take control and he will bring 1,000 years of peace and prosperity to the earth. An amazing thing. You know what? If you can have somebody that can bring 1,000 years of peace and prosperity, why would you not choose that? Why would you not choose him? Except that people are real stubborn, aren't they? Well, verse 15, Then the angel said to me, um, The waters where the prostitute um, is ruling represents masses of people of every nation and language. How big is the Catholic Church today? It's worldwide. Will there be every nation, tongue, and entity, in a sense, worshiping during that time? Absolutely. And we can see that today. During John's time, this would not have made sense to him. It does to us, um, which is simple. Well, <clears throat> the scarlet beast and his ten horns all hate the prostitute. Oh, what just happened? Wait a minute. We were, we were together. We were doing good. We were having church and we're politically falling. We bowed down to you and everybody is for you. And now you hate us. Isn't that the way it usually goes? Oh, yeah, you guys are fine over there. Just keep doing your thing until, until we don't like what you're doing or we don't have any need for you anymore. Go away. Interesting, isn't it? It is fascinating to see how things unfold, not only physically in our world, but also spiritually in the scriptures the Antichrist will turn against the church. <clears throat> so does the church today, the one that's here right now, need to stand up for Jesus? Absolutely. You remember in Hitler's day, there were 3,000 churches that were for him. There were 3,000 churches that were against him. And what happened to those 3,000 churches? He killed them or took them prisoner and then killed them. There were about 12,000 or more during that time that just said, hey, look, you know, we're just doing our church thing. We don't want to really be involved. And when he had all power, what happened to those churches? Yeah. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. And then he, he uh, did some very evil things. Same thing is going to happen. It's this continuous little wheel that happens. Well, the scarlet beast and the ten horns um, will all hate the prostitute, uh, and they will strip her naked eat her flesh, and burn her remains with fire. So 
um, they're going to turn against the church. And uh, I suggest to you that it's because those that are in the church that would have read the Bible will have opened up the book of Revelation and they will see a lot of these things happening. And it's very possible that even those that in the tribulation time that would go to this church are able to open up a Bible or understand the things of the Bible and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is not what we thought was going to happen. This is really happening. This guy is the Antichrist, and they may even stand up and come against him, in which case then he says, and then you're done. Verse 17, wrapping things up. For God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out whose purpose? His. Guess what is happening right now? God's purpose is being accomplished. Whether it is in the Middle East or whether it is here in America, whether it is in Europe um, or wherever, God is putting his plan into action. A plan that will carry out his purpose. They will agree to give authority to the scarlet beast. And so the words of God will be fulfilled. Now, are we all going to die tomorrow during the eclipse? No. Is the rapture going to happen tomorrow during the eclipse? No. Eh, probably not. You know, uh, a little too much of a, well, that was obvious um, kind of thing <laughs> when the scripture doesn't say that. But it says here um, that all of this will happen so that the words of God will be fulfilled. God's word is a promise. Do you keep all of your promises? No. Does God keep all of his promises? Yes. Absolutely. So we can trust the word of God. And this woman who you saw in your vision represents the great city that rules over the kings of the world. So when this is wrapped up here, this verse 18, who would John have known to be the ruler at the current time? Rome. So at the end of time in the book of Revelation, when this is happening, who is going to rule Rome. spiritually? Rome. The revived Catholic Roman Empire and the church will spiritually be in control. But what will happen? Uh, there's going to be some conflict from the political side of things, and it's going to go a little haywire. What I have to say today is, aren't you glad that the word of God will be fulfilled? Yes. Amen. And I am glad that when he tells us that he died one time for how many sins of the world? Oh. All of them, that he really meant it. Your sins are forgiven. And if you believe in Jesus as the S-O-N, the Son of God, if you believe in him as God, and you say, hey, I want you to take control of my life. I want you to lead me, not kings, not um, the entities of this world, but I want you, Jesus, to rule my life. And God says, that's the kind of attitude that I like. Your sins are forgiven. That is an amazing deal. And you and I, although we've done nothing to deserve it, get to go on a honeymoon for seven years with Jesus while all of this is happening back on earth. Isn't that an amazing thing? So, Father, we thank you that we will get to go on our honeymoon with you. You are our bridegroom, and you call the church your bride. And, Father, today we are so excited to understand once again that your word will be fulfilled. It is going to come true just as you have spoken it. Now, Lord, I know that many people say, oh, these are just words written on a paper by man and that we shouldn't believe any of this except for the fact that every single word that we have seen in the Bible, Lord, has come true. Father, we know that your word is true. Your word is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. And Father, if we walk away from what you have said, if we walk away from what you have taught us, then we move away from the light and into the darkness. And that is such an evil and dangerous place to be. 
because we understand that there is an enemy who comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Father, you came that we might have life and life more abundantly. Father, we thank you that we have heaven to look forward to. So until that time, Lord, let us do what you've asked us to do. You left us with two rules, to love you with all of our hearts and our minds. But also, Lord, you said to love our neighbors in the same way. So Father, let us go and love people today to help them to understand that their sins are forgiven, that they are not condemned if they accept you. Father, thank you for the love that you've shown to us. We love you in return. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you and keep you. Have a great week. We'll see you here next week or in the air tomorrow. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Not a dollar will be floating up.